Di James, Collier, 41 years of age, married with four children. At work 1,200 feet below ground at the coal face of a Ronda pit. A few yards along this five-foot seam, his workmate Jim Hopkins, 31, married with two children. Two colliers then, two of the 7,000 odd mine workers employed today in the Ronda Valleys. Even with the mechanical aid of pneumatic pick and belt conveyor, it's still hard graft. It's a dirty job. It's dark. It can be dangerous. To do the work needs skill and strength. To do it daily needs quick wits and a rough-tongued philosophy and a rude, ready humour, often as dry as the pit dust itself. As they work below, or as they tramp back a mile or so along the tunnelled roadway to pit bottom at the end of shift, these men are the present heirs of an ancient order that's lasted for a century and a half, a democracy of work shared by generation after generation under the earth. This is their story and the story of Ronva. And in its essentials, it's the story of all the valleys in the coalfield of South Wales. Up here, on the crest of the pass over Rigos Mountain, we're over half a mile above that five-foot seam of coal. This is the fingertip of Ronva's northwest arm. Only 20 miles down the winding road is Cardiff and the sea. But up here, the wind blows over stones that saw the earliest life of man. And the valley is a carved and twisting gash in the moorland plateau, the flat top of North Glamorgan. To a geologist, the tale begins in the rocks of Ronda. Well, the early beginnings of the story of the Ronda Valley can be taken back to at least 300 million years ago, a time geologically when most of the British area uh, was covered with extensive coal measure forests. Uh, each coal measure forest eventually decayed, giving rise to a great bed of peat, which was eventually to make coal. And this land on which the forest grew subsided, and the rivers brought down new sediment that covered the coal seam. Muds became mudstones, clays became shales, sands became sandstones. Towards the end of this coal measure forest period, there, a significant thing happened, as far as the Ronda is concerned, at least. Uh, there was a great period of deposition of sandstone. Sandstone uh, known as now as the pennant sandstone. And this is the rock which, of course, is the major scenic feature in the Ronda. And the rivers which have carved out our valleys have breached this plateau-like cover, uh, giving rise to the now famous Ronda and Ronda, Ronda Var and Ronda Vach valleys. Below the sandstone, the black seams lie, layer upon layer, a gigantic sandwich of coal upon rock upon coal, 
flattened and twisted by the weight of ages. Today, you can trace some of the upper measures along the valley side, where old levels pockmark the outcrop. But at the beginning of the 19th century, only a few black furrows broke the surface of the mountain turf. Above the untapped coal was land owned by great estates like Butte and Dunraven, leased out and worked by farmers and shepherds, a solitude of sheep walks and wooded hill slopes. The revolution that was to change it utterly began when the first industrial pioneer came to the valley. It began here at Dinas, a century and a half ago. This patch of black shale on which I'm now standing is all that now marks the site of the first pit in Honda. It was in 1809 that Walter Coffin of Bridge End left the family tannery to prospect for coal here at the lower end of the valley. He started with levels driven into the mountainside, tapping the two upper seams of coal. Then, in 1812, he sank this pit. Forty yards down, his men struck the rich Bordringacht seam, the Ronda number three. It was this seam, nearly three feet thick, that became known throughout the country as Coffin's Coal. Early levels and the first pit made little difference as yet to the valley. It was still a rustic economy of sheep farming and forestry and domestic crops, and the crafts of Smith and Sawyer and Miller that sufficed a self-reliant community. This was Coffin's second pit in Fronda. It's walled up now and overgrown, but the shaft is still there, under the ferns and brambles, reaching down 80 yards to the tunneled roads below. Under this ground, with naked lights and with only the most primitive ventilation, 300 men and over 100 boys hacked, sweated, cut the coal through the long hours of darkness. And along this narrow west bank of the river, between the two Dinas pits, in Company Cottage, or Lodging House, lived the first mining community of the Fonda. It was the first smudge of dark mound and grey stone on the green pattern of the valley. There's not much left of this first industrial chapter in the story. Much of the old Dinas lies flattened under post-war factory sites. Many of the Dinas people have been rehoused elsewhere. What's left is practically deserted, awaiting the council shovel and bulldozer, the stone debris along the riverside that once housed a harsh and vibrant life of its own. In the derelict cottages and the gaunt tenements, the windows are empty sockets, blind eyes now above an empty lane, where once the coal trams groaned down the rough track to the canal and Cardiff. Once, every room here held a bed, and every bed a miner. Along the Dinas Road, the pubs still bear the names of the farmlands on which they were built, but they no longer slake the thirst and temper of that age of hard labor. Nothing remains of those first mining families of Ronda, nothing but names lost in the crumbling burial ground below Ebenezer Chapel. These first people were country folk, laborers from the farms of Ronda and from the Vale of Glamorgan. Here, the godly among them set up a Methodist cause in 1825. At Cummer, a mile or so lower down the valley, the earliest non-conformist cause in Ronza had long been established. Farmers and their families, riding here on Sundays to worship at the Independent Chapel in the year 1847, could see below them as they rode, on the bank above the river, another pit being sunk. This was another and successful search for the number three scene. The monopoly of Walter Coffin and the growing sale of his house coal had brought up to Ronza a Cardiff shipping merchant, George Insole. It was Insole who sank the Cummer Old Pit and who sank two more pits within a few years. These first coal owners were speculators concerned with the profits of speculation. With cheap, unskilled labor and primitive methods, speed of output was the vital factor, not safety of working. Overmen and firemen were far too few. The working day was 12 hours and more. The atmosphere foul with gases and the lack of ventilation. And a quarter of the labor force was juvenile. Boys began at six years old, opening and closing the air doors. On them rested the safety of the working. Out of the darkness of those early pits come the echoes of their voices. The Dinas lads who gave evidence to the commission on child labor in 1842. 
My name is Philip Davis. I am 10 years of age. I've been riding horses below ground three years. I work 12 hours a day. I never walk at school. My name is Matthew Lewis. I began to work when I was seven. I was burnt by the, fi by the fire damp when I was winding the airborne. Some others were burnt at the same time, one almost to death. It was these boys, pallid, stunted and broken before their time, and the brute strength and endurance of their fathers who raised the coal and built the fortunes of their masters. The first tram of coal raised in a new venture was a matter for celebration amongst owners and shareholders rejoicing safely above the ground. Disaster. Like the Kummer explosion of 1856 that killed 114 men and boys was inevitable in these gas-ridden and ill-managed pits. The daily accident rate was appalling. Lacking all safety, men were crushed or burnt or suffocated or drowned. And with a packed jury at the inquest, there was no question of compensation awards against the owners or their managers. For widow or orphan, there was only the final humiliation of parish relief. But mining, with all its brutal profit and loss, was still confined to the shallow house coal seams below Porth and Dina. The steam coal, which was already making the nearby Aberdare Valley prosperous, was still to be found in Ronda. It was discovered first here, at the top of the Ronda Vaur at Treherbert. In his diary, W.S. Clark, mineral agent to the Butte estate, records, 16th of October, 1851, we commenced sinking the pit at six o'clock this morning. Here, below this ground, the upper four feet seam of steam coal was proved at a depth of 125 yards. By 1855, the colliery was complete, and on December the 21st, the first train of 38 wagons of Ronza steam coal went down the newly opened railway to Cardiff. This was the turning point. Under the farmlands and sheep walks, up and down the length of Ronza, the big deep shafts were driven to the steam coal, down to the two feet nine and the four feet and six feet seams. In 20 years, 25 new pits were at work in the two valleys. To the men who owned the land or mineral rights of Ronza, men like Lord Bute or David Davis of Flandinum or the coal exporting brothers, John and Richard Corey of Cardiff, here was a measureless reservoir of wealth. Year by year, as the sinkings continued and new seams were opened, revenues and sales and profits rose to new and gratifying heights. In Cardiff and in the Vale of Glamorgan, the mock medieval castles and stately houses flourished, well away to the south of the valley that paid for them. Absenteeism in Ronza began with the owners. But some were local and stayed. Some were immigrants who stayed. A Scot, for example, who gained a monumental place, Archibald Hood from Ayrshire. In 1864, he struck the deeper steam coal measures below Sunapir to found the Glamorgan Colliery and the township that rapidly grew up around it. Hood settled at Glyn Cornell. The men who came to work for him were housed in humbler fashion. The hasty rows along the side of the hill above the pit became the pattern of Ronza housing the terrace. Over the mountain in the twin valley of Ronsavach, David Davis of Blangwaur and his son Lewis Davis sank the first pit at Ferndale. Above the pit across the valley stood the colliery offices. Today, small boys and wandering sheep have shattered the windows and ravaged the interiors. All that's left is a debris of forgotten paperwork and the memories of past profits. And memories, too, of the human cost of coal, the long lists of fractures and amputations, the record of accidents that marked a man for compensation. And above the offices, the family house, now derelict, and soon to be rebuilt by local authority as a home for the old. A final act, perhaps, of compensation. Lower down the valley at Anasir, 
we can see this proximity of Pithead and Big House as it must have been in the latter half of the century. James Thomas began life as a door boy and hewed coal himself until he'd saved enough to begin a mining venture at Tinewith. In 1877, he sank the standard colliery here. To local owners like these, there was a paternalism within limits, the limits allowed by Victorian ideas of the right relation between capital and labor. The masters, even the local ones, were screened by distance and by social position from the people who manned their pits. What sort of people were they, these miners and their families of a century ago? And how did they live? There's one Victorian observer. In the good times of coal, a few of the colliers were provident and put by money for a rainy day. But the mass spent their money lavishly. But two strikes in demand of better pay and a bitter five-month lockout in 1875 must have left little money for extravagant living. The strikes won a brief pay increase. The lockout that followed ended in new wage cuts sent women and children to the tips scavenging for coal and broke the miners' first attempt at industrial union. The folk who were not chattel goers were catered for by the public houses. There was much drinking. Pay was fortnightly. And on those pay Saturdays, as they were called, disreputable scenes were common, remarks another observer. Certainly there was distraction in violence in the dogfight or the bare fist battle on the mountain. Social life reflected the even greater violence of working life. As pits grew deeper, so they grew more dangerous. Two great explosions in two years at Ferndale claimed 231 lives. In the second half of the century, 800 miners died in colliery explosions in Romba. The numbers who died in individual accidents underground during those years will never be known. In one year alone, 1887, the South Wales Miners Provident Society dealt with 10,000 cases of disablement, one man injured in every four who joined. And in that year, fatal accidents placed on the funds 74 widows and 161 children. And rough printed ballads and broadsheets hawked about the valleys at a penny a copy made crude memorial for the dead. But every disaster brought its tale of courage and none finer than at the flooding of Tinewith Pit in 1877. While officials and doctors waited above, the rescuers, working in ceaseless relays and without regard for their own safety, fought to reach their trapped comrades. After 10 days and nights, four men and a lad of 16 were plucked still living from their tomb of rock. Five had died in the first rush of water, but the survivors and their rescuers had become national heroes and were posed in solemn fashion before the cameras of the day. And names like Isaac Pride and Happy Dog are legends still in Romba. Among those men at Tinoiz was a colliery manager, Daniel Thomas, awarded the Albert Medal for his gallantry. At the Dinas explosion two years later, he led the rescue effort and he died leading a rescue team into the after damp at Penagraig in 1884. And around his memorial are the names of those who died in the Dinas pit, buried here in a mass grave on the hillside. Here at Triallo lie the past generations, many of them people who came here in the booming years of the steam coal sinking. They came at first locally, tramping over the mountains in search of work from the declining ironworks of Mercer and the older mining districts. Peace rates and day wages were often 25% higher in Ronda than elsewhere. As more pits were sunk, migration to Ronda became a flood from all parts of Wales and from beyond its borders, leaving the wretched poverty of the land, the laborers and their families poured into the valley. In 1870, there were 20,000 people in Ronda in the next 10 years, the population more than doubled itself. By the turn of the century, 113,000 lived in the two narrow valleys, a cross-bred mixture with a strength and vigor all its own. Among those immigrants were the ancestors of Will Whitehead, miners' leader. My father worked in the pits in the Ronda, 
As a matter of fact, he left the forest of Dean, an agricultural area, to come to Ronda because there was coal in the earth. My mother, too, uh, she came with her family, or at least her family came before us, uh, down to the Ronda in order to uh, open pits. They came down with the Davis Landinum family. And uh, both came from areas where the land offered little reward for working people. And they were determined to come down to what was virtually the Black Klondike. This Black Klondike bore all the signs of greedy haste in the making. Most of the trees were stripped from the mountains for pit props. The mining waste was spilled in great tips over the green slope. As in the early days at Dina, some of the owners held their mineral rights under short lease, and their sole aim was to get the coal out quickly. In the 60s and 70s, few owners did more than throw up wooden huts or a few streets of cottages for their first workmen. The vast majority of Ronza houses were built by private, speculative builders. Mostly, they used the local tenant stone for the small five-roomed houses. Street upon street, terrace above is Ronza's pleasant legacy. And there were never enough houses. In that explosion of population in the 80s, in almost every home there were lodges. Beds were often occupied day and night, and the valley stood high on the blacklist of Victorian overcrowding. This teeming life was often rude and sometimes riotous. Yet many of these immigrants brought with them a native culture already formed and a stern faith in nonconformity. In Pontentra, for example, the Reverend Alban Davis explains the beginnings of community. It must be remembered that the coal industry developed itself, as far as Arfanda is concerned, around the pits. It is a succession of villages. The people came from, in particular, they came from the west, from Carmarthenshire, Pembrokeshire and Cardiganshire. They brought with them their own customs and they brought with them, likewise, their own denominational beliefs. The result was that every denomination had its setting within the particular village. In the first creative stage in the life of the community itself, the churches played a dual task concerned of necessity about worship, but also about sustaining and developing the cultural life of the people. The whole life of the valley, as it were, centered around the churches, and they were definitely in the center. One must remember also that the churches contained the two elements, both master and masters and men. These new masters or pioneers actually were radical nonconformists who sought the new liberty to establish and to discover ways of adventure and investment. These men were regarded almost in a feudal fashion by the miners themselves. In those early days, it was possible for masters and men to worship together and to sing together in the great singing meeting, the Kiman Vagani. Uh, I, I suppose one of the most remarkable commandments ever uh, uh, took place at Carmel, Sir Herbert, not long after the Kama disaster, when Dr. Joseph Parry had written an anthem, which I think it was called the Miners' Anthem, and incorporating the hymn which the entombed miners sang as they awaited the deliverance. Well, this so gripped the, the choir and congregation that they kept on repeating it and repeating it until eventually, I understand it, was sung about 17 times. By the time they'd come to the end, the conductor himself were lay exhausted in the pulpit and the singing was going on regardless. The ministers of those days were eloquent and patriarchal figures. As conductor and schoolmaster Jack Hayden Davis claims, they were the real leaders of their community. They were the focal points of culture. For instance, uh, I myself was taught by uh, my minister, the Reverend Canon Evans G and L, not Gin and Lime as some of the wags said, but uh, graduate and licentiate of the Tonic So Far College, because he taught me and gave me really the only musical certificate that I possess. Uh, also, we were taught in school by the uh, class teachers. But one of the notable names, I think, was that of Moses Owen Jones, M.O. Jones, M.O. 
who came to St. Herbert in about the 1860s. He was a, a pioneer composer, and his interest in music and uh, his friendship with a, a local printer, uh, Isaac Jones of Caxton Press, led to the uh, installation of the first press that could print tonic for farce in Wales. And it's uh, a fact that at one period, all the Gamandagani programs in Tonic for Farce were printed at Caxton Press to Herbert. In the last of the Victorian years in Ronda, this chapel-based culture with its stern disciplines and rigid code of behavior was the strong core of community life. For most of these people, there was work to be had and pay to be earned. There was food for the large families, the families that bred more miners in their turn, as a retired miner like Sam Samuels remembers. But there's one thing about it, we always have plenty of food. Always that, because my father was a good worker. Well, he was a miner all his life. He liked his pint of beer. Drank a lot of beer in his time, no doubt about it. But to me, he was a good father. I don't think any of us children want to complain to him anything at all about him. We was all told uh, 18 in family. We were seven, seven brothers and nine sisters. And a very good mother. For Sam and for many a lad like him, school days were short and he was down the pit with his father at 11 years of age. In those days... I came here about, with my parents about 62 years ago, as a boy of 13, to work in the mine. And you know, when I look back and think of those hard work, low wages, the struggle to make ends meet, <laughs> I sometimes wonder whether I, whether we, sur how we survived it all. But we did, you know. The mine has always been a fighter, and he still is one, it doesn't need to. When I started as a boy, my wages was a shilling a day, coming light and opening doors. And believe me, a little boy comes from the country, never heard the language we heard then up there as we did in the mines. I came one of the finest curses that ever went in the ground. And Halliers at that time, you know, they were wonderful characters. They always used to tease me, to get me out of temper, just to hear me cussing. You see. And uh, I started to chew buckle. They caught all of me one day and put, put me on my back, put a chew buckle in my mouth, and kept me there like you did. And boy, boy, it was nice sick. But I had the taste of it, and I carried on with it. Well, I had about eight or nine lamps by my side, you know, hanging in a sort of a manhole. And if a collier came around, of course, no lamps for colliers, only for alias. If he had tobacco, he have a lamp. No tobacco, no lamp. Well, I was in that job about six months. Then I came to Triorki, and I had a job with the presenter of the Methodist Fight. And there was a good boy with him. And with him I worked until I was about 18. Then I had a place of my own. A boy like Prussell Williams, growing up in Ronza at the beginning of this century, well knew his working destiny. And school was only a short interval between the cradle and the pit. But for the children of the valleys, as Jack Hayden Davis recalls, the game of life began in the street. There we, on a winter's night, we would gather under the lamppost or around the window of a little shop, a little street shop, and uh, that was the meeting place of the gang, of the street gang. We had our own games, uh, daylight games, and games after dark as well. I suppose cat and dog would be the great daylight game. Marbles, uh, one and over, the host of names that come back, they've all vanished now because, mainly because of the, the traffic making the street a very dangerous place to be in. But uh, street life was a, a great part in, in our existence. Uh, there were no cars. Uh, you just had the horses and the, and, and, and the, and the traps and the, and the carts. And so there was no difficulty at all in playing uh, any of these uh, uproarious games. 
in, in, in the streets. And in the same way, you're always susceptible to the temptation to go up to the uh, pit and uh, make yourself a nuisance by playing around amongst the trams. And if you're very quick, of course, spotting the, the, the bobby who would chase you off the premises. Then, of course, there was the mountains. Uh, we, we loved going up to the mountains and playing on the mountainside. And some of the streams were still fishable. And uh, during the fine weather, it was uh, very pleasant indeed uh, to go there and uh, with your ducking drawers and, and dive in and, and, and swim about and plash by way, I suppose, of being a, a rehearsal to the great time when you would go down with the Sunday school trip uh, to Barry or Fourth Gaul and swim around in the great big sea itself. Youngsters at the junior school at Ustrad still play as happily as they did when Sir Ben Bowen Thomas went there as a boy. But those dominant shadows of Shaft and Pithead no longer lie across school days all over the home itself. The uh, whole of my home was dominated by the fact that my father earned his living in, in the coal mines. He would come in as black as the ace of spades uh, of an evening, a late afternoon, and the whole uh, household would be concerned to return him to the, to, to, to the white color, and my mother would be concerned to get the dirty clothes out of the way and uh, well shaken and aired and prepared for the, for the morning. And then I would hear him uh, go out, in a, uh, I suppose sometimes even before six o'clock in the morning uh, to his uh, work, and what happened in the mines was, was the thing that uh, uh, really colored the whole of our lives. In these streets, in these closely packed houses, life achieved a great sense of solidarity and of genuine concern for the members of each family. My mother always regarded Friday night as set aside to go to her sister's house to help with the preparing of the clothes, children's clothes, the washing of the clothes perhaps, to um, help in the, the baking, making cakes or possibly bread uh, for the family. And then the other elder sister would probably go up on the Monday morning to give a hand with the large wash of this large uh, family. Uh, women took a great deal of pride in having a big family. And it was a pleasure to see them go into chapel on a Sunday with all the family together, filling probably up about two pews. It was a, a great accomplishment then to be the mother of eight or nine or ten. But today, of course, things are different. Today, the woman that had eight or nine or ten children is looked upon with a great deal of disdain and contempt. And the pride of place today and the boast undoubtedly with many women is that they've only got a family of two, what is what they call a pigeon pair. As Yari Thomas says, there was pride in family. Pride too in a respectability as sharply defined and firmly based as the community itself. To many, the new century looked fair and prosperous, even adventurous and go ahead, when up the main street and around the gossip's corner, tramway lines were laid and the first trams rattled their way to the top end of the valley. There was pride in appearance, pride in a brave turnout of volunteers like these, ready for any emergency, even if performance sometimes dimmed that brassy splendor. And the pawn shop was a reminder that pride was still based on the uneasy economics of coal. But the big events were still domestic rather than economic, the long and solemn funeral, perhaps, most of all. It appealed to a people often close to the realities of death and loss. And dominating the scene like great tents of stone were the chapels, now in their spiritual and physical heyday. This is Nebo the uh, mother church of the Baptist churches in the Rhondda Valley. And uh, the place where uh, I was brought up in uh, a religious sense. Uh, it would be difficult to uh, overestimate the uh, meaning of an institution of this kind uh, to the folk of those days because it was here that they identified themselves with uh, a framework, with an outlook that gave meaning to their lives, that gave purpose to their lives and that, that would then activate them in their relationships with their members and in the way in which they would personally try to conduct themselves. And in addition, of course, within the uh, church, all kinds of activities, apart from the preaching services and the Sunday schools, to enable uh, young people to uh, use and to develop the gifts that were in them. 
Much of the social entertainment of the day was still chapel-based. The popular playhouse, like the old Theatre Royal at Tonopandy, was still regarded with suspicion by the devout chapel-goer. But these were days in which the melodrama of real life was gathering its own momentum. Well, I suppose the melting pot of Rhonda reached its highest temperatures in the early to early years of this century, say from 1900 on, when we had terrific clashes between the incoming people from different parts of the world, people with different interests. It was a violent time, violent in religion with, with, with uh, religious revivals, violent on the political side with the riots and uh, all the rest of it. And then, of course, we had the great vigor of competitive singing. I suppose choirs formed themselves mainly around the chapels in those days, and uh, competition was a, was, a, was a terrific thing. We had a choir in Vanacombe Chapel of 400 voices at that time, conducted by a, a young man, uh, Evan Watkins. Well, he was actually 16. It was called Cora Crutton. And there, their famous piece was another violent piece of music, which is called Stone Him to Death. In 1904, the religious revival flared briefly into emotional light. One can speak of the revival itself as being an organized effort on the part of the churches to renew its defenses against the new political spirits. It was an emphasis upon saving souls, an emphasis on other worldliness, and once souls, so to speak, had been saved, and once they felt that their future had been laid up in heaven, uh, there was little else left for them by way of direction uh, from the church and from the pulpit in regard to life in this world. And after all, it's life in this world that is of significance uh, to uh, us as human beings. And it so happened that at that very same time, there was developing in politics and economics uh, a creative movement for social betterment, uh, which I am sorry to say uh, wasn't uh, taken into the church to the measure that it might have been, uh, with the result that it developed apart from it. And so you had uh, many of these young men uh, actually disowned by the church, the young men who went in uh, to uh, radical politics, to the ILP, to syndicalism, and later into what we call labor politics and possibly, possibly the communist movement. That is, the young people whom I used to listen to talking up by the Bridge End Hotel in Tonpentre or on the mountainside in Penrhys, people calling the workers to work out their own salvation. There is a great date in the life of the valley. It is the date of the, the year of the Tonopandi strike. Now there you have the division and the final division and separation between the churches and the new radical elements. Down there to my left is Dunraven Street, one of the main shopping streets in Vonda. Northwards that way lies the road to Philippeer and Tonpentra. And up that steep hill there, past the smart new flats and the smart new club, is the way to Kiddach Vale. Down that narrow street a few months ago came the silent army of Ronza miners, escorting their dead comrades from the Cambrian pit to their long home on the mountainside at Triallo. They walked in sorrow where their fathers marched in anger. For this is Pandy Square in Tonopandy. This was the storm center in the days of the Cambrian Combine Strike. Because of what happened here, the date 1910 and the name Tonopandi are forever part of the racial memory of these mining valleys. The road to Pandy Square and to the great outburst of industrial and political violence starts a long way back from the Tonopandi of today. Outside the pub on the square, the men still squat, minor fashion, and talk together with the same dry, bantering humor. But the talk is not of old battles or of the men who led the strife. Ronza today has little time for history, said one of them. The past is behind us. Let it stay that way. The older men, sunning themselves on the benches, will point out the first shop window smashed in the riots. But the names of the past leaders stir only faint memories now. Names like Ablett and Rees, Hopler and Smith, that were once the ready coin of argument. Perhaps from one of them, there'll be a word about Mabon.
A very fine old gentleman, one of the best gentlemen, no doubt, we've ever had in the room, no, yeah? Well, in fact, we had one day on a Monday, and we had a stop day for it. And they call that Mabon's Day. That was a holiday. William Abraham, the legendary Mabon. For 50 years, a trade union leader. For 35 years, member of parliament for Romva. His counsel was always conciliation. His slogan, half a loaf is better than no bread. He became the miners' representative on the Joint Sliding Scale Association. This pegged wages up or down to the selling price of coal and gave 17 years of uneasy peace to the coal field. But younger leaders demanded that profits, not selling price, should determine pay. In 1893, the Holliers' strike brought violence and troops to the Ronva. In 1898, the sliding scale was abandoned and the South Wales Miners' Federation was born. As if in answer, the ruthlessly efficient D.A. Thomas, later Lord Ronva, began the grouping of pits that by 1910 had become the powerful Cambrian Combine. In 1905, two major explosions had shaken Ronva, at the Cambrian Pit, at Cliddach Vale, and at Wattstown. Between them, they killed 150 men. In one street in Wattstown, every house mourned a man lost. Such disasters as these inflamed opinion, even amongst men hardened to the daily toll of accidents. Uh, to see that procession coming from the colliery. Uh, we knew that if the stretcher would be carried at waist high, that the man was only injured. If the stretcher had been carried on the shoulders, we knew that he had been killed. And that we were just children would walk behind, and very often we'd see the blood dripping, dripping from the stretcher onto the floor, and just see the boots of the man coming from underneath his sack. Finally, in 1909, came the Eight Hours Act. This reduced hours of work, but it also reduced earnings. Many older men were dismissed, there was still no payment for small coal, and, the vital sparking point of strike, no extra pay for work in bad scenes. Veteran miners leader Will Mainwaring looks back now across the years at the relative strengths of masters and men poised as they were for battle. When the uh, Cambrian Combine strike started, the Cambrian Combine Colliery Company was really in clover because the Coal Owners Association had agreed that they would subsidize the combine to the tune of two shillings per tonne for all the coal that was not raised for a whole 12 months. You can imagine what it means. 12,000 miners, 12,000 tons of coal per day, 12,000 times two shillings a tonne right through the many months of that struggle. And that's where the strength and the resources on the owner's side appear to be. On our side, trade unionism divided, as it was then much more than now in South Wales, about 20 different districts. Rhonda was simply one of them, and the combine here was only a portion of this Rhonda. Now there was a problem if we were going to enter into the struggle, the challenge was bound to come. What resources had we? Well, we had to make a very serious decision. Were we going to enter into a struggle and hope to carry it through and win on the basis of a strike pay? We had none. In August 1910, the spark was set to the powder. At the naval colliery Penagraig, one of the Cambrian Combine pits, 70 men demanded a piece rate of two and sixpence a tonne to work the difficult Butte scenes. The management offered one and ninepence a tonne. First, the company, to enforce the proper terms upon the naval workmen, tendered notices to 800 men. Naturally, this aroused the opposition of naval and the other combine lodges. And we, when the notices to the 800 came to an end, that also would be the signal for a stoppage of the whole 12,000 men. The story of the violence that followed the beginning of the Cambrian strike is a tangled web of conflicting and far from impartial accounts. Certainly in that autumn of 1910, there was a brooding anger and great bitterness throughout mid Ronva, and large numbers of extra police had been drafted into the area in anticipation of trouble. Most of them were deployed to guard colliery premises, 
and at the Glamorgan Colliery at Luna Pier, the owners decided to maintain the pumps and ventilation by bringing in stokers from outside. When, on the night of the 7th of November, the strikers learnt of this import of blackleg labour, they marched on the colliery and fiercely attacked the police lodged inside. After a sharp skirmish, the strikers were driven off and more police were rushed into the valley. On the following day, a minor demonstration in Tonopandi itself was broken up by repeated charges and the free use of police truncheons. The miners fought back with fists and stones, and there were broken heads and limbs on both sides of the battle. During the day and night that followed, windows were smashed and shops were looted. Hastily, shopkeepers boarded up their windows and assumed a state of siege. Tonopandi was now no longer a local disturbance, and the Home Secretary was asked for military aid. He sent 500 Metropolitan Police with troops in reserve. Many in Ronza have reviled this action of Churchill's, but Will Mainwaring takes a different view. We never thought that Winston Churchill had exceeded his natural responsibility as Home Secretary. The military that came into the area did not commit one single act that aroused the slightest resentment by the strikers. On the contrary, we regarded the military as having come in the form of friends in order to modify the otherwise ruthless attitude of the police force. There was more violence at the end of November. Many strikers manned the pumps under guard and all forces of police remained in the valley. The Scotland argument. Negotiations between the South Wales Miners' Federation and the owners, with the Board of Trade holding the ring, continued in an atmosphere charged with fierce dispute. The original demand of the men for fairer pay for working a bad or difficult seam was changed to a call for a minimum wage for all workers. By August 1911, the strike was ten months old. In mid Ronza, there was intense and widespread suffering. The impetus of violence slowly died as miners and their big families grew wretched with need. The resources of the unions were almost exhausted. In the local chapels, men climbed the pulpit steps to receive their weekly strike pay. Now, even this pittance was reduced. The end was inevitable. By September, the men had accepted the owner's terms. But to their leaders, this was only an interval before renewing the struggle. We were then satisfied. Time has now arrived when we can safely say we'll accept the terms that have been proffered to us. We'll return to work and prepare for the other struggle, which must come within three months. And um, one thing I was rather proud of, um, the Cumbria and my own lodge, having been through the full 10 months struggle, only partially returned to work as yet. Indeed, I had still another year to go before I returned to work. But having done all that, we balloted the Cumbrian miners. Are you now prepared to join in another strike? A struggle for the minimum wage. And the highest majority in the whole of Britain came from the Cameron Lodge. In support of a new and more militant unionism, Mainwaring and his fellow leaders set up the unofficial reform committee and published a celebrated and explosive pamphlet. The purpose we had in mind in preparing this miners' next step was to consider with our fellow miners everywhere, does the existing trade union structure fulfill what you think is required or would you agree with us that we need a completely transformed structure of trade unionism, a new unionism for the miners of this country? And eventually, we appointed eight persons to summarize the whole thing and write it up in the form of a pamphlet. And thus, eventually, it became published by ourselves in time to influence the National Conference of the Miners of Great Britain and produced a national minimum wage under the then Prime Minister H.H. H. Asquith. So we had a final victory to what we had aimed to do. The Cambrian strike not only led the drive to a minimum wage, it also broke the power of the older miners' leaders in Ronva. Conciliation and arbitration were rejected by the younger elements 
and Mabon's day was done. In 1912, the owners were faced with the first national strike of coal miners in Great Britain. For six weeks, conference and mediation failed to move either side until a government intervened and the principle of a minimum wage was accepted by Parliament. The year that followed saw the high peak of coal output. Nearly 10 million tonnes were raised in Ronda. Demand was high and so were profits, but mining was still a cheap method industry. Well, the work on the ground at those days were very hard mine. The labourer's wage was only three and six to four shillings. The collier, of course, if you had a good seam of coal, you'd be all right. But if you had a poor seam, you had to live on what the coal he could produce, especially large coal, because there was no payment paid for small coal then, until the minimum wage act came in. And then it wasn't much better, because the same thing happened then. If you had a poor place, you wouldn't be able to make your money up to the minimum. You'd have to fight for this, and we had to fight. You used to stand on top of that pit, you know, clothes soaking wet, you know, with sweat, wait for the manager to come up. And of course, he'd always stay down longer on a Friday than he would any other day, you see, because he knew we were up there. And then the fire would start. An act of parliament was one thing. Getting your rights at the pithead was another. Yet these last years of peace in Europe were the halcyon days of the trade. Ocean and Insole, Ferndale and Standard, Corey and Cambrian. Truck after loaded truck spread a black trail to factory or docks. The whole motive force of industry came from the deep themes of places like Ronda. And across the seas, along the imperial trade routes, were the coaling stations, the great stores of bunker coal to feed the shipping of the world. In 1914, Corey Brothers alone owned 80 such depots. And the roaring furnaces of liners like Mauritania breaking the record for the Atlantic crossing, were stoked on coal hewed in the pits of Park and Dare and Mainly. When it came, the war maintained the boom years in the valleys. Britain's great battle fleets were coal-fired. So were the factories of war. Although many Ronza men joined the forces, coal was so vital to the war effort that by the end of 1916, the government had limited the recruiting of miners. In light and heavy industry, women took over men's work. The miners returned to the pits and by 1917, the industry was brought under national control. The Board of Trade regulated wages, conditions, and hours of work, everything except profits. And despite the names on the war memorials, these were good years for Ronda. But they were soon over. By 1921, Ronda was again on strike. Smart National Coal Strike had followed the handing back of the mines to the owners and the drastic wage cuts that came from falling markets and rising costs. In bitter anger, the men demanded the pits be abandoned. Safety officials were forced out and Holliers brought up their horses to join the workless men on the surface. It lasted three months. In Ronza, strike action became a series of struggles to promote or to prevent the flooding of the pits. But despite protest and picketing, there was little violence. One national newspaper said, the 40,000 miners of the Ronza Valley are conducting themselves with commendable calm and not a single case of lawlessness has been reported recently. Some pits were flooded and once again troops and extra police came to the valley. The strike ended in hardship and defeat, wage cuts and victimization. Once again, the people of Ronza had only themselves to turn to in their need. The ceiling was very warm in the Ronda in those days, much different to now. Everybody was so near to each other, and if they could do you a good turn, they would do it. But the neighbors were husbands. Everybody would help one another.
and their families in the Rhonda were not prepared to go down in this struggle against uh, social and natural forces. They recognized that they must have food, they must have houses, they must have clothing. clothing. These elementary essentials of life. And so they decided that if present society wouldn't give them, then they must change society. And this is what they set about doing. And Rhonda became one of the most militant and at the same time probably the most democratic place on the face of the earth. Will Whitehead, miners' leader on the 20s and 30s in Rhonda. Along this derelict and now deserted street called the Concrete, soon to be raised to the ground, you can still feel something of the atmosphere of decay and depression that began in the valley with the general strike of 1926. No one can credit how hard it was in the Rhonda of the, in the two strikes. There was no opening at all to have or go anywhere until everybody had gone miserable. The men were very miserable. They'd hung around the corners from early to late, didn't know what was to do with themselves. They do a little turn to have cigarettes, wherever it was possible to get the little job to do. There wasn't a lot around because everybody was in the same boat. All in the same boat, too, were the men who marched about the idle valley through that long summer. Men who were fiercely partisan and utterly committed to the struggle, right or wrong. I don't think it was the, uh, the wrong of the men. It was the wrong of the coal owners, of course. Not the men. Because the men was forced in the end to go back because of anger and the children. Driven back the way. That's it was every time. But in the beginning, there was a spirit amongst them of optimism and holiday, and a welcome chance to make sporting carnival. general strike and all through the dreary months when the miners fought on alone, Ronza men were leaders as grimly implacable as the owners who opposed them. Men like A.J. Cook who had become secretary of the Miners' Federation of Great Britain in 1924. Noah Ablett, veteran of Tonopandy in 1910. And Arthur Horner, later to be champion of Ronza's unemployed. Unemployment on a national scale now became the post-strike pattern. This was a world adrift in an economic chaos to which there seemed no end or answer. In all the industrial areas of Britain, the queues lengthened through the years, the queues for relief, the dole queues that stretched wearily outside the labour exchange in every town and valley, the hopeless quest for work, for anything, and the losing fight against poverty. There can be no argument or doubt about the evidence of poverty it was there for everyone to see in the faces of the children pinched and wan lackluster eyes on their clothes which were the clothes of adults cut down or else were the clothes of older children and were ill-fitting their shoes with the toes poking out of the front of the boots uh, then uh, there was the general uh, lack of energy with with the children if there was one consolation, it was that we were all poor together. And in times of strike, we all went to the soup kitchens together. <coughs> Every boy had the Tate and Lyle tin cut down to size and a handle of tin soldered on. And this tin was basin and cup together. His soup went into this tin and so did his cocoa at the soup kitchen. The soup kitchens have left with many in Romba the memory of pride swallowed with the stew and the cocoa. Memories of full bellies in an empty existence. For Yari Thomas, memories of the volunteers who ran them. Oh, the soup kitchens, of course, were um, well organized. Uh, we had uh, 
certain members of the lodge committee in charge of the provisions, doing the ordering, and you had others in charge of the fires. You uh, had some old boys who'd been in the army as cooks, volunteering to do that work, and used to come to the kitchens at five o'clock in the morning to prepare. And mind you, he took some preparation too, because we had young lads then spending most of the mornings on the mountain playing football, coming down, of course, with a hunger. And by gosh, you ought to see the size of their basins when they come in to have those meals. It was the pride of most miners in those days, when wages were low, of course, they all had allotment. Well, when the strike came, and there was need for providing people with food, these men went to their allotments and brought their vegetables, cabbages, peas, potatoes, whatever they had, in order to help the soup kitchen to carry on its function. You can see marks on the mountains, you know, where we, we've been digging the coal, sheltering for the sheep, uh, sheep and all that it is now today, with grass going all over it. The coal was provided by men volunteering to go in rota to the mountains into these levels, and mind you, risking their lives. Some of them were killed, really, in these, in these levels. Some of them were, had their backs broken in their endeavor to get coal for themselves, of course, and a quarter was always given to the soup kitchens in order to feed the fires. The problem then was for desperate men to maintain their families, for the door was little enough. And so what did they do? They had to revert to desperate measures. There is one famous street in the Ronda. It has two or three names. Its proper name I shall not tell you. The two other names are Sheepskin Avenue or Mutton Tump. And it was known that in that street, men used to take it by turn to kill the sheep and share the meat out amongst the families in the street. And the police never found out how they did it. Under the crude banner of hunger, desperate men marched out of the valleys to join other worthless comrades from Wales, from the Midlands, from the North, on the road to London to publicize and proclaim their need. The hunger marches of the 20s and 30s spread a stain of shame over the face of Britain. They were the symbols of disaster in finance and trade, even more so disaster in terms of human relations and the concern of man for man. Prior to the depression itself, as a miners agent, I knew that there were 45,000 miners regularly employed and of course members of the organization. After this tremendous somersault in trading conditions, I found 35,000 miners unemployed. And you can imagine the social effect of such a situation. By 1932, over half of all the men in Ronza were out of work. Many of them were destined never in their lives to work again. Year by year, as they rolled by, these people, men and women alike, gradually settled down to the acceptance of the standard of life which was possible on the basis of unemployment benefits, in some cases some additional assistance from national assistance. But how they settled down to that and lived as best they could, and at the same time exemplary people in every, in every respect, fighting against misfortune, gosh, what, what, what courage the people had. Yeah. I remember we were waiting for the Friday for the door. My husband would go to the shop and fetch just uh, sugar, butter, tea, cheese. And then the children would say, now, Mum, for a nice dinner with fresh cheese and bread and butter. I remember we used to go down to the carry farms that on a Friday there used to be a, a market, I don't know, to jockey. And you would have a leg of mutton for about a bob. The one and six, two shirts for half a crown, cheap fruits, and fish. <laughs> I remember we used to go down on fish day and have a hake about a yard long, you know, for a bob. We'd string it on our back and walk all the way up to Tremont. Well, of course, mind the family today won't see what we see. They are having family allowance to help them, which is a great boon to them. We have to keep our children on two shillings. 
And I had to send my children away when they were 14, my two girls, to earn their own living. The plight of the miner came to the notice of the Society of Friends and of Emma Noble in particular, who got permission to come to Rhonda on a three-week observation visit. She stayed with her husband among the Rhonda miner for just under 20 years. As Glyn Jones says, the immediate task was material, to clothe children and parents in need, to distribute the help that now began to arrive from outside. But more than this, the Society of Friends set up an educational settlement at Meister Havre to help the rebuilding of local and communal life. Men were now anxious to get together in some sort of organization where they could uh, vent their feelings about the whole thing and try to do something about it. The establishment of unemployed clubs followed and grew up overnight. Many clubs sprang up like mushrooms overnight. And we saw established in these centers in very short time a boot repairing shop for the repairing of members' shoes and boots, the uh, workshop for carpentry where re household repairs could take place and uh, furniture made, and it is the proud boast of one young man at the time that he made every stick of furniture before he got married. And that furniture is still in use today. Oh, they were a big boon. Believe you me, our men would have gone out of their minds because it took them from their homes because the woman could have never stood a strain of having the man in the home knowing how he felt because he wasn't working. So of course they turned to the unemployed club, which we've got to thank the Quakers for. And I think they deserve all the credit because it's through them that we've kept our reason. Then from the men's club, the women's club formed. And they helped to keep the women their morale up because otherwise, I believe, we would have cracked up. Already uh, the need for coal uh, was making itself felt in every household and permission was granted to unemployed miners to ferret out coal from the, the tip which have buried within them many tons of coal. Our husbands, I don't mind telling you, have to go to the tip. They have to sell a bag of coal and that helps to bring in something for the children. I think that is the lesson of the Depression, that in moments of material need and suffering, people have a concern, a genuine concern for others. That has been totally, perhaps a strong word, almost totally eclipsed uh, by the welfare state of today and this chasing after the bonus. The Miners' Institute, with its library and reading room, became the Parliament of Poverty. Up the top of Rondevach, for instance, at Mardi, the Workmen's Hall and its classes on Sunday afternoons bred a vivid consciousness of rights and wrongs. This, this is the famous classroom uh, at Mardi, where Arthur Horner and some of his conspirators, I think that's the right term to use, used to meet and discuss the affairs of the world. Uh, and a classroom it was in the very real sense. But the sort of things which were taught here were not the three hours, although they were part of it, but not them alone. What was taught here was economics, political economy, dialectical materialism, strange words these, uh, world history, amongst other things. And the emphasis was on the, the thoughts, the concepts of Marx and Lenin. Classes of this sort were common throughout the whole of the Ronda Valley in those evil days, uh, as much as anything because men had very little other places to go, and the institute was the focal point of social contact, as it were. But not only did they teach the social sciences there, they dealt with more practical day-to-day -day things. So many men were unemployed, and so many were on the means test, uh, that they were being denied the means of existence. And People like Arthur Horner and others, in such classes as this, taught men the unemployment uh, acts and taught them how to defeat the uh, ways of the insurance officers, taught them how to get more money for their families. And these were the sort of things which were, which, were, which, were, which were taught to men, in addition to the social sciences. It was, in fact, the adult university of the Ronda, the University of Hard Knocks. 
few pits were working and they were on short time. A few nailed boots still rang along the streets, but to get a job at all was a matter of chance or favour. The queues on top of the colliery there, all waiting and queuing up for work. About 30, 40, even 50 men at a time, waiting for the manager to come out and select who we want. Here he comes and we point. You, 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 three, four, perhaps five men, not many more. They turn around quite as if there was nobody there and say, well, you can all buzz off now, you have it. In those years of idleness, many a man, like Trevor Parker, turned to the lofts behind the terrace and to one of the miners' abiding hobbies. Keeping pigeons was our only little bit of pastime. We used to have our private little races, penny, tuppence, or threepence entry of a pigeon. We'd walk miles as far as Merthyr or Penderyn or anywhere like that. We'd spin the knife, get to the pot, select two men who let the birds go, walk in there, have a little sweep. Well, it was all clean sport and nice bit of fun. On the weekend, we'd have a game of football. Uh, that used to be up in the old favourite place up on the battlefield. We'd be starting about nine o'clock. Half time would be about roughly about two o'clock, half past two, and we all have to retire for dinner. Back, day, back again after dinner, for the second half, that would be roughly about six or seven hours of playing football non-stop. the brave days of carnival and jazz band competition. The mocking derision of the gazooka was perhaps Ronza's reaction to depression and to a valley of workless men. Bad times or good, Ronza still bred its own kind of sportsman, equally at home on a rough mountain pitch as in a bad place underground. And above all, as Cliff Morgan claims, great fighters. And I look across from the Ronza now where I'm standing and look at Penrever where Tom Thomas, one of the great fighters of the old days, uh, used to wrestle with a bull to prove his strength before he pitted his skills in the ring against many and varied opponents. Uh, I think of Scarlet's fan, Jimmy Wilde. Jimmy Wilde, who one day said to me, Mr. Scarrett was a kind man. He used to get me in the ring, about 20 or 30 fights I used to have in one day. And one afternoon, having knocked out 10, Mr. Scarrett said, Done well, Jimmy, he said, Now come down the caravan by here with me and have a cup of tea and a bun. He went down on a cup of tea and a bun and came back and knocked out six more. The fairground boxing booth run by Scarrett was a tough nursery, not only for Ronva's champions, but for many a young lad like Reg Edwards, with handy fists an empty pocket. Scarlett was on the rostrum, shouting odds, and just the World Cup up, and we'd, we'd accept uh, the boxer of our choice. Usually the boxers that Scarlett took around with them were hard hitters, boys that were capable of stopping uh, their opponent. Very often, there were British champions being paraded, but the economic circumstance was so and that you'd have a go at anybody to earn a pound. It is true that we were hungry and we were mostly doing it for the money that was in it. In the 30s, one Ronza boxer came very near a world title. Tommy Farr of Tonopandy fought his way up to become our best heavyweight between the wars. Here's the victorious end of his first bout with Max Baer. But there were other fights, not for purses, but for principles. In 1935, for example, at the Dare Pit Kumpart. There was conflict then about what union the miners should join. And the miners in this pit decided, in order to establish their right to join the union they wanted, their own, they decided to stay down the pit. And 80 men stood down in this pit for nine days. And eventually, they solved the problem by forcing the company to concede all their demands. And they earned the right 
to join their own union. Now, this was a fight not for bread, simple. During those nine days and nights, the men down the pit, of course, had to pass the time away somehow, and they did it by holding concerts, competitions for singing and rhyming and limericks, and of course, you had undoubtedly the usual type of Welsh story. And the final day, when they were about to come up the pit, they gathered at pit bottom, and Tommy Lewis Sugar, they called him, a musical conductor in the locality, called the men together and led them in singing the doxology. And people who were gathered at the pit head heard the strains of this music come up the shaft, which was the closing chapter in this epic. <laughs> blessings left for Rhonda in those days. In 10 years, 20,000, mostly the young, left their homes and the endless idleness of the street corner and dole queue to find a living elsewhere. And they carried Rhonda into dispersion. I personally organized two deputations to successive prime ministers. And I well remember Mr. Stanley, the Minister of Labour in, 19, in 1935, telling the deputation that we should do everything in our power to get the men away from their misery. It was obvious that as far as the government was then concerned, that there was only one task to be done, and that was to take away the men and the young men and the young people from the valley itself. Now that migration became a definite flood. It was a one-way ticket and a one-way traffic. And those young men and young women were never destined to return. Most of the people of the Ronda went away from here to Coventry, Birmingham and London, and they've never come back because they are better off there. I had the heartache to see so many going from here. I myself have never gone with all the hardship. It robbed Ronda of its uh, most virile, the most promising of its population, leaving Rhonda sadly burdened with uh, a, a larger percentage than should be of aged population. And so it continues up to this day. It is still affecting the situation here in Rhonda. The last of Rhonda's vigorous life drained away through the 30s, away from the silent tip and the gaunt and derelict shaft. Many of these pits were closed never to reopen. The two Ronvers lay inert and helpless and dying. The first faint kiss of economic life came with work in factories outside the valley. In 1936, the Trafalis Trading Estate was established and light industry began to make some inroad into the numbers of workless men. By 1939, two factories had been built in Ronva itself, but until the war began, migration and unemployment continued. September 1939, once again, war demanded coal, and the aging and almost worn out pits were galvanized into activity. Dramatically, almost overnight, Ronza found itself re-employed. Now, hands grown soft in idleness, hardened again at the coal face. Into the moribund coal field came life and purpose and wages. The call up brought the Bevin boys to the pit to eke out a mining population shrunken by wastage. And after victory came vesting day. The nationalization of the industry in 1947 must have seemed a miner's millennium, a final lasting triumph. At last, the pits belonged to the people, what was left of them. In Ronda, area manager Gerald Blackmore talked of the position as the NCB found it in 1947. There were some 14 working units in the Ronda Valley itself, employing some 14,000 people and in the first year of nationalization turned out about two and a half million saleable tons. And it's interesting to compare what the position is today, because during that period the 14 pits have come down and we now only have seven pits. And the interesting factor, there are a little under 7,000 men. But despite this lower manpower, 
and the higher rate of absenteeism. We are currently producing some from the seven collieries, a million and a half tons. So this means that the productivity per worker in this period of 18 years has gone up by some 40%. Mechanization has produced new ways of working, like the two foot eight scene here at Cambrian. The working face is no higher than a tabletop. Under this low roof, miners used to crouch or lie prone for hours, cutting coal by hand. Now the steel plow rips along the hundred yard face, gouging the coal onto the belt conveyors. The miner at last has adequate tools for his trade. Above ground too, wherever it's economically possible, there's been modernization. With Mardi's new look pit, the best example in Romva. Mechanization is a very wide subject and is not purely confined to coal getting on the face by machine. Um, no doubt you'll remember years ago men used to do an awful lot of hand tramming, but on the modern pit today you will find that at pit tops and pit bottoms trams are moved by mechanical means. Uh, likewise, in the old days the coal was conveyed from the face to the pit bottom in trams, whereas today there's a growing tendency for either um, locomotive haulage to be used, but more particularly um, belt conveyed from the coal face right to the pit bottom where it's loaded. All these are factors of mechanization, uh, in addition to coal face mechanization, where of course the productivity, both in this valley and all over the country, has uh, led the world in terms of new techniques to um, get coal at the cheapest price and equate against this receding manpower force. There lies the problem. The pool of labor, skilled and unskilled, that for so long sustained the pits of the valley is drying up. Mechanization can replace manpower, but only up to a certain maximum point. I believe the conditioner for the future rests in the manpower position. We have had this tremendous rundown in manpower in recent years, um, and in the end you can't work pits without men. No matter how much you do and by way of mechanization at the coal face and elsewhere, you are dependent on men in the bitter end. In the end, it depends on men like these, on Di and Jim and their comrades still at work in the Ronda today, the minority that remains of what was once the great majority. <laughs>